Hi, everybody. Welcome to the special CUBE presentation. We're here at the BECC in Boston, where the CUBE started in 2010, the first CUBE ever at EMC World in 2010. Really excited to have this special presentation here inside the IBM studio. It's fantastic. Varun Bishlani is here. He's the global managing partner for hybrid cloud services at IBM. And Hillary Hunter, who's the CTO and GM Innovation. Love that title for IBM infrastructure folks. Welcome back to the Cube. Thanks so much. Thank you so <laughs> much. You. Great to see you guys. So, last week we put out a post on our breaking analysis talking about the sort of intersection between hybrid cloud and AI, what we called hybrid AI. We clearly see these two things coming together in a different pace. And so, I wonder if you could share your thoughts on what you're seeing from customers going around this show at IBM Think. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What do you expect for the intersection of those two concepts? Yeah, I definitely want to hear a little bit more about your data, but I think just to share some of ours, if you look back like six or seven years ago, hybrid cloud wasn't so much a thing. Cloud was sort of a place where you went to do your computing, where you went to use your AI. And I think the reality from our polling is today, if you ask CIOs how much uh, their cloud estate represents hybrid cloud, about 70% of them will say that they actually have a hybrid cloud infrastructure. So hybrid cloud is a thing, it's a thing everyone is doing, but it often, when you dig into the details, is actually a bunch of disparate and heterogeneous cloud environments and not a unified place that you really have a platform to create new things. So thank you for that, Varun. I think in some ways, IBM maybe has an unfair bias, and here's what I mean by that. What our data shows is that, and I think this has become sort of a bromide, bring AI to the data, a lot of data on-prem. I think a lot, tons of enterprise data, if you, if you take out video for consumers, is on-prem. What I mean by the unfair bias is, in order for hybrid AI to happen, you've got to have the, the tooling You've got to have the LLM optionality. You've got to have the ecosystem. Actually, IBM has those things. That's why I say it's sort of an unfair bias. A lot of the sort of traditional on-prem vendors maybe don't have that. I wonder if you could, you could comment on how you're bringing that all together. I, I think the, the first fundamental thought out here is that there is a very significant symbiotic relationship between hybrid cloud and AI. And today, you know, AI is supremely accelerating the execution of hybrid cloud. And at the same time, you can't really go from pilot to production to scale without a robust architecture. So I think that's the first reason why this conversation right now is so, is so relevant. Yeah, and then in terms of our own independence, our, our thought process around this is about making sure that we are allowing you to accelerate the value of your own data. Up until now, all the conversations have been about, I've got models with large amount of public data, but the amount of enterprise data in there is next to negligible. Your differentiation is going to come when you can take your data and use that with those right models. And I think that's where we've decided to make our conversation much more open. And you heard today, you know, a, a granite is now open sourced. And then you start saying, where do we have the unfair advantage? Because we're bringing it out to the whole world and changing the game in how they consume their own data with these models. Hillary, the other key piece, of course, is developers. Yeah. Right. And so with Red Hat obviously brings you a wealth of, of developer chops. So what, what we see is, is sometimes we call it super cloud, but it's a, it's a, it's a metaphor for a consistent experience irrespective yeah. of physical location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you guys have this concept of hybrid by design. Right. You know, some people talk about multi-cloud cloud by design. They sort of go, go together and then hybrid, that extends to hybrid AI. How do you think about that? Yeah, you know, when we first started talking about hybrid cloud 2018, around the acquisition of Red Hat, a lot of it was about the developer, giving the developer yeah. a consistent set of procedures and DevOps and tools and Kubernetes environment to operate in the same way across a bunch of different locations. And I think what's happening now is, is twofold. One, we have added on Instana, Turbonomic, Aptio, the ability to have observability, manage your workloads, optimize those workloads, optimize your costs across all environments in a consistent way, which gives you a platform that you're working with. Um, and then in addition, AI is no longer something that's only in one place. The AI can be where your data is, where your workloads need to be, where your customers are. And so our platform approach to AI 
means then that, that both conversations, managing, viewing, optimizing a bunch of different environments and the developer experience can all be consistent. And then an AI platform that enables you to bring together the data needed for AI, those models, the governance of those models, monitoring of all of that, those can each be in any location across the hybrid cloud landscape, from on-premises to public cloud and out to the edge. I think, you know, I, I love what Hillary says here. And to just substantiate that further with the business priority lens, so what, how does the CEO look at that same conversation? Because this conversation is no longer just a technology conversation. Absolutely. And what we are also seeing is, earlier in that journey, there was such a rapid shift to let me get to the cloud and figure out how things would work, that we are seeing one in three programs, or our, our, our CXOs are telling us that one in three of their programs are not on time or on budget. One in four are not really returning hard ROI. And when you start delving into why that's working, uh, you know, those who are successful, there are certain patterns emerging in that. And I'd like to call out, you know, five patterns that emerge. One, those that are successful are very product centric. And what I mean by that is business product centric. Like, um, I have a loan origination product. I've got an insurance product, a baggage handling product, that. And they are looking at value in terms of those services that they provide their customers. That is determining the technical architectural choices that they are making. Earlier it was, I'm going to go technology choices and I'm going to figure out how the business will consume it. Now we are seeing these are architectural choices depending on their business objective. And then to Hillary's point, this consistency of developer experience, consistency of operational experience is also becoming very, very important. That's why we're talking about this by design or this intentional thought process which is now emerging. And I look at those as, as some of data products. Right? Yeah. I mean, in many respects, the, the examples that you were, you were giving. We see a couple of vectors in terms of the whole hybrid cloud, hybrid AI. One is, you know, people went to the cloud and said, well, it's maybe a little too expensive. I can do it you know, more, more cost effectively on-prem. The other is very intentionally saying, I'm going to run the experiment and the, the POC and the MVP. I'm going to get it up and running in the cloud. And then I'm specifically, I have the intention of bringing it on-prem. Yeah. Do you see those two vectors and there's probably a bunch of stuff in between, but how do you see it? Absolutely, 100%. A lot of people are looking to build and create to train their model or tune their model in a public cloud yeah. environment and then bring it on premises. We see clients even doing AI on the mainframe because they're wanting to do something at ultra low latency. And so when latency comes into play, when cost, as Varun was alluding to, comes into play, you're going to choose to do the data preparation, the model creation, and then the model deployment in the locations that help you optimize all those factors. I want to pick up on something Varun was talking about in terms of the ROI. You know, consumer uh, AI, Gen AI, the, the ROI of building, you know, million GPU clusters, I know we're not there yet, but it's pretty obvious. Better ads, you, you, could, you could get more revenue. I mean, okay. The ROI in the enterprise, a lot of singles being hit today, and a lot of misses, swing right. and misses, to your point. A couple of data points, and I want you to see if it aligns with what you guys see. Our survey data with our partner ETR shows about 42% of the customers say they're funding Gen AI from other budgets. And when you dig into those, it's non-IT budgets, it's business lines, it's productivity apps, some legacy RPA seems to be getting hit. And the ROI timelines are, are elongating, because I think to your point, people are realizing, well, maybe it's not so easy. Because the apps today with Gen AI are very chatty. Okay, are you seeing that? And how do you see that playing out over time? So I, I think uh, spot on in terms of it is singles being hit right now. And also this idea about tougher ROI. And I think one of the reasons of this tougher ROI was right now it's a lot of experimentation. And they don't even know how to measure the ROI on the back of that. It's not all ROI in terms of revenue generation ROI. It's a lot of productivity use cases that are, and then how do you measure partial productivity? That becomes a whole new gamut of you know, conversation. W you know, one of the examples, this client was looking at a large transformation program using cloud and AI. And when they first started looking at this, they said, 
our our transformation is going to take us x number of years roi will start returning only in year 4 and 5 and imagine taking that to the board it's impossible so then you start looking at saying which business domain what use case and you start driving roi within the current year and i think that's what we are seeing right now and if you add to that the conversation if you already heard about instruct lab oh amazing isn't that now that's magic that in terms of roi within within the quarter within the year and when you start really extracting value of your own data i think that's going to change the game significantly now so what i see happening there I love your thoughts is you, you develop you can train that's great then then you develop your rag and then you can sort of automate the the tuning which is amazing and you've got this open open ecosystem that will allow some ROI instantly that can throw off okay. cash and then you can gain share and then because people want some big big hairy projects but to your point it's going to take 4 or 5 years to achieve those and it's hard to get those funded but it's going to take that long to solve some of the really challenging healthcare problems or logistical issues etc so what what I would forecast is you're going to see those singles you know maybe turn into doubles throw off some cash and then that will help fund or at least loosen up the purse strings how do you think about that well i see that the two conversations we started talking about hybrid and ai mm -hmm. uh, sorry hybrid or cloud let's say hybrid cloud and ai are together for a reason we talked about why but i think also from this how do you fund ai perspective the two are related i mean right. we see we have one instance where in a cluster using turbonomic they've been able to reclaim 30% of the gpu utilization by doing appropriate workload balancing by dropping down to that lower level of the it stack and optimization they just got back a lot of budget to drive yeah. their ai you know experimentation yeah. and things like that alternatively we worked with the university of queensland 74% faster in their medical research because of a storage upgrade to storage scale product and so folks are looking at those lower levels to find optimization opportunities find more throughput and self fund these ai projects by really eliminating technical debt differences in uh, operations across different environments all those things we were talking about before can be a way that you can actually fund ai it doesn't necessarily just have to be budget stealing from one category or the other oh ab absolutely you 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 know look at how core business processes are run the payment process the insurance handling process the finance transaction process what ai is now doing in the gen ai is now doing in the conversation it's not a bolt on to that particular process those processes are being completely rethought out yeah. and when you start rethinking that entire process you're getting 30 to 50% benefit because of the gen ai you're getting up to 70% benefit because you've redefined that process yeah. and i think that's what's going to start emerging as a big conversation so going down to the the lower levels to yeah. start ex executing value and changing the way you execute on your processes and i guess i close saying just making the observation that the cloud is no longer a remote set of services somewhere out there in the cloud it's it's the public cloud it's on prem it's out to the edge and and it's a substantially identical experience across with things like open shift and 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 that creates new opportunities when you bring in ai there may be some great tools in one cloud and you might have your own proprietary data that gives you advantage on prem you're going to use all those but to the extent that you can create that seamless sorry to use that word but that abstraction yeah that is going to create many many new opportunities I'll give you the last word i know you got a hard stop but so please hillary give well, us a close well, i'll just say you know you want to get a grip on your data right that's why the yeah. ai platform conversation for us starts with data and data platform so you get a grip on your data across that landscape that's the first step then you have your ai capabilities and then at the back end so to say you have the governance and the monitoring of those ai capabilities mm -hmm. no matter where they are and if you think of this whole environment uh, holistically and look at the underlying infrastructure and the opportunities to create consistency across environments you can get ai at scale safely and in almost a self-funding kind of a way and i think that's the really exciting opportunity of how these two conversations are coming together love it Today, final thoughts bro. i'll just add on to that actually and in order to help our clients execute on this how do you go about doing what hillary just said and you know our hybrid by design framework takes you on that journey how do you start looking at all of these different aspects right from which business products to what kind of teams what kind of architecture the gen ai platforms the security requirements the framework allows you to demystify that journey 
and actually start releasing value. So hybrid by design comes from there. <laughs> Guys, uh, I, I posted on my LinkedIn, I haven't been this excited about IBM in 10 years. Uh, I, I meant it and I can tell the, that you guys are excited as well. Really appreciate your time. Thanks Thank so you so much. Okay, keep it right there. We're, we're not live, but we will be shortly <laughs> on demand at thecube.net. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. We'll be right back.